Hello, everybody. This is SF Spark. Uh, I'm Alexei Krabro, the co organizer of SF Spark Meetup, and we're at, like, on location at Galvanize University. And today we are speaking with Adam Gibson, uh, who is the creator of Deep Learning for J, uh, the open source uh, toolkit for deep learning on JVM and also scientific computing on JVM, uh, including libraries such as ND4J, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and also founder of SkyMind, a uh, company which commercializes uh, applications of deep learning and uh, uh, all these uh, interesting insights. So let me ask you, Adam, first, uh, I watched your video, I think the, the, the way I found uh, SkyMind, I found the video where I was saying that a few years ago we did not actually practice machine learning much, and you, you uh, ramped up by watching a lot of videos, immersing yourself, and now you are you know, producer of one of the most advanced packages. So this is really amazing, and you know, this is what a lot of folks get into data science aspire to do. How, what was your motivation to get into the field, and how did you manage in such a short a time to basically learn so much? How did you do this? It's funny, so in general, I mean, I dropped out of school, I've always been self-taught, uh, so it mainly comes down to the fact that, you know, you just need motivation and grit. It seriously, it was just a combination of me reading papers and implementing concepts mm -hmm. and repeatedly making mistakes until I learned what I needed to learn. Um, so I have like an implementer's perspective on a lot of things, just like I just, I like to tear things apart, uh, very similar to any engineer really, and just figure out how does this work, what does it do, and decomposing it. Um, then just kind of going from there. Um, so what fascinates me in general about machine learning is just this ability to have computers think on their own. Mm -hmm. So machine perception has always been something I've been curious about because it's like, well, you know, if I don't have to tell a computer with an if statement what to do, what, what are the possibilities? And then, you know, you just kind of expand from there. So why deep learning, right? There is a lot of different things. What pick your interest in machine learning and specifically in deep learning? Well, so in general, I would say, first of all, the difficulty of it was alluring to me. You know, so they're you know, neural nets are difficult to tune. Mm -hmm. They're slow to train. So, you know, obviously distributed systems and, you know, in this case, more complex hardware such as GPUs, you know, were a great engineering challenge for me. I wanted to build something that not a lot of the industry would dare to tackle because it's not practical or it didn't it didn't make sense for their use case, and you know I like I like jumping down rabbit holes and figuring out how things work, uh, and something as complex as deep learning allowed me to do that. That's great. You know, a lot of people kind of you know uh, avoid uh, rabbit holes, but and 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 uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's kind of a, it's a black box system, right? In a way, uh, uh, deep learning you know produces some some uh, uh, solution, but it's hard to understand. So that's it's, it's a lot of work to to make them work in practice. Uh, so I wonder how do you deal with this fact that 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 this is a very uh, complex system which gives you a result in some way, but but you don't know how this result. Is is achieved. So how do you debug uh, something like that? Frankly, histor so visually. So the trick with neural nets is that you don't actually just run them and hope for a result. Mm -hmm. I mean, not even grid search work works with neural nets. What you do is you actually do things like histogram the weights mm -hmm. and figure out, you know, is it changing too much? Is it overfitting? Is it changing too fast? You can also do what I like to call monitoring machine dreaming. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, for vision, you can actually plot the weights and see like actually it drawing faces and reconstructing things. So you can actually see what individual neurons tend to activate on, mm -hmm. which gives you the ability to figure out, well, how well is it rendering this? And that, that gives you an idea of how well it's converged. Mm -hmm. Also, the ability, also I would add the ability to plot the activations and seeing like, you know, relative to each iteration, seeing like, you know, how dark it, like basically the darker it is, the more unsure it is. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, you can see it converge when it's basically like all mostly white, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a way, it's so actually, it's a way of actually just figuring out how fast is the neural net training and what is it doing. Another, another one is text. Mm -hmm. You can actually, with these neural word embeddings, glo Glove, word to vec, you know, there's more than just word to vec out there. More than just word to vec. Get, you know, get, get familiar with that. Neural word embeddings themselves, um, basically, allow, you can actually like, group the words with something called T-stochastic neighbor embedding. So you can actually see it group one, two, three, four, five over here, and then maybe Spanish words over here. Mm -hmm. So there's actually, you just need tools to actually visualize it. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. That's great. Uh, and uh, it's actually it's funny because you know now that I think about it, it's kind of ironic because you're using your own neural net, right? right. Visual processing to get an impression of how the artificial neural net is performing, right? And that's probably kind of I mean, of course we're using it for all kinds of cognition, but that actually seems a, like a visual way is a very fitting way to evaluate this. Uh, so for J is kind of you know it's, I think it's a play on the classic you know self for J and log for J, right? So this is used in kind of Java community to signify some kind of hard core Java focus and and uh, it's a set of conventions basically for for JVM so so you made this choice to run on JVM compared to a lot of data scientists who run on you know Lua and Python and Ruby and R and whatnot and and uh, I wonder like how did you make this choice in the first place and how do you see this uh, comparison with other folks evolving like why JVM why do you stay on JVM and what does JVM have going for it that you know we should as data scientists kind of uh, work more with JVM well think about it what are production st data stacks written in they're written on Hadoop they're written mm -hmm. on Spark mm -hmm. they're written in Scala the modern data pipelines are on the JVM. Yes. Why not be a first class citizen right where the data lives in the same process? Mm -hmm. There's no reason we can't do that. A lot of problems though with machine learning up till now in the JVM has just been the fact that there hasn't been a library that gives data scientists familiar syntax. Mm -hmm. So you know, I drew a lot of comparisons between me teaching uh, Python data scientists as well as training other experts on Java, mm -hmm. you know, like I drew comparisons and figured out what the JVM was missing. Mm -hmm. And one of those things was yet another matrix library. So, yes. you know, we, we see the XKCD, you know, standard plus one. But at the end of the day, what I, what I, the, the approach I took was why not just take, you know, every, every matrix library in existence and put it all under one interface, just like SLF4J. Mm -hmm. So why not solve it once and for all and give them, give data scientists an, an updatable library that's future proof mm -hmm. and give them familiar syntax. So I wrote that. I used, ND, I used ND4j, my library, to write Deep Learning 4j. And so I future proofed, the, I future -proofed it and also made it agnostic to a particular runtime as well. Mm -hmm. So I can be where the data lives, but also be, you know, get access to more you know, faster libraries like CUDA and so many other things. Yeah, CUDA is actually another amazing example because you work with GPUs and uh, your software allows actually to choose uh, a GPU implementation if it's available, right? So I think that really bridges the gap which uh, a lot of uh, things like R and Python have going, you know, with C linkage, right? We can actually have an access to, to GPUs as well from, from the Java world and I think that really makes, I think it's uh, distributed both in, in the, in the multi-core setup and also across the cluster, which kind of brings me to Spark, I don't know if you know everybody is familiar with Spark, but maybe you can kind of uh, reiterate the points why uh, deploying for J and Spark makes such a killer combination. Well, so one thing that not most of the industry is doing is this idea of Jeff Dean style parameter averaging. So the ability to take a neural net, train it on several cores or workers, and then average the results. Mm -hmm. And th this has been proven results that Google uses in most of their machine learning infrastructure. So just like Hadoop, you know, modeled MapReduce, why not model, you know, with iterative reduce our, you know, the kind of our uh, take on parameter averaging, you know, why can't we scale that out with Spark? It's a mm -hmm. perfect, you know, it's a perfect model where you just, you know, you, tr you scale out with Spark mm -hmm. and you just average the results and you can use, you can use Spark storage and RDDs and all that mm -hmm. to basically build a, an infinitely scalable system. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think that's you know, and being a memory that actually gives us a speed up, uh, right? Uh, which you know was missing in the original Hadoop architecture. So that's I think that's the timing is really perfect. And given the Spark uptake, right? Where the Spark meetup, all this, three hundred people are coming tonight to 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 learn about this, right? I think that's a great opportunity uh, to advance scientific computing and JVM. So you know, being the founder of SkyMind, I got to ask you, right? So you see these technologies, you also are connected to the startup community. Where you know, do, where are you taking this? Like, what is your vision? for SkyMind, how are you going to kind of uh, uh, take these technologies and implement them? So we're an already profitable startup that mainly works with Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. So the most interesting problems are where there's a lot of data. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually typically work with more, you know, with, you know, modern enterprises who have Hadoop, they have some stack, and they just need, they have a certain problem they need solved. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we facilitate problem solving right now. 
we're not primarily working with startups. I mean, you know, mainly because like REST APIs and all that, there's, there's plenty of that stuff out there for normal developers. Right. We're targeting the enterprise developer who doesn't have access, like who doesn't have access outside the firewall, mm -hmm. and they need something that's a first class citizen on their cluster. Mm -hmm. So we work more with Fortune 500 companies over uh, startups in this case. You know, there's plenty of that out there. There's plenty of access JavaScript accessible things. We're bridging into Python and some other libraries, you know, because deporting 4 js would be a great server as well. But you know, primarily uh, Hadoop, Hadoop oriented uh, companies. Great. And so, uh, in terms of domain space, right? So, if you're one of Fortune 500 companies, what kind of problems, what kind of data makes more sense to use with deploying for J? Well, so just like we think, just like we can see things, we can perceive them, right? So deep learning is good at actually making sense of things that we normally we normally see and learn from. So you know, humans are really good at pattern recognition with sight, reading things, mm -hmm. you know, it basically ingesting patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, deep learning is specifically unstructured data, yes. video, image, text. You know, things that things that we see that maybe a data scientist has a hard time trying to pick apart the features for. So I help. I mainly help Fortune 500 companies make sense of unstructured data, mm -hmm. uh, and usually they have a lot of it in you know the Hadoop file system, and then they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. We kind of help them bridge that gap. Yeah, and the text I think is a great example, right? Because Vision uh, is a classic uh, application of deep learning, but it turns out the text makes actually a very great domain for deep learning as well, and uh, that's that's a huge focus. Uh, in, the, in the data mining community now as well. Well, that's great, and uh, uh, I guess uh, 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 the question I would ask, because this is an engineering meetup, and we have a lot of hype about deep learning, but here we have the folks who can actually do this, who can take a piece of open source and understand this. So if I am a fairly good engineer who is interested in deep learning, and specifically I want to learn it by looking at deep learning for J code base, right? What, like, is it, is it, something which I should just plunge into, like uh, how can I essentially get my hands dirty with deep learning for J, understand how it works, uh, do you have uh, some projects I can just take and run with them? So we have, a f we have a few example projects out there, but I would still highly recommend playing with Core and actually understand the architecture. Mm -hmm. So there's actually, two, there's actually two major modules. There's Core, which is the core algorithms, where you can run them, play with them. I usually just run the tests. Um, what I want to do is actually put out more curated examples for people to just play with. Mm -hmm. Right now, I just have a lot of examples derived from the unit tests. Mm -hmm. You know, not highly tuned, but you know, it shows Which you example great usage. To hear that you have, right? right? Not everybody has unit tests. Right. So. You know, so I mean, you know, we have a very well unit tested code base, and mm -hmm. I, I recommend just diving into cores, core, and understanding the layout, understanding mm -hmm. where, where the layers are, the core API, and then working from there. Scale out is just parameter averaging, so it just averages whatever whatever you're going to do in core. Yes. Uh, okay, okay, great. And since, the, the, as I understand, the project is currently mostly in Java, you know, and uh, I also help uh, organize the Scala uh, community. So, uh, what is uh, the challenge to Scala developers? Where can we come in and kind of uh, help with DSLs and kind of uh, APIs? Where would you need most help from the Scala folks? ND4j, because you guys, you know, you guys want functional programming, you want operator overloading, yep. you want you want a lot of the fancy features. So I actually have, I've actually already put out an ND4j Scala API module that people can just modify. Mm -hmm. um, so I've started, I've actually started work on a wrapper interface for the Java. So after we get that, you'll have essentially scientific computing in Scala mm -hmm. with Scala S syntax. Yes. And then from there, I would, I, from there, I would want more, you know, in the algorithm space, I would want more functional oriented uh, deep learning algorithms as well. Great. Well, you know, if you are a Scala developer uh, watching this, and uh, especially in Scala, I would say let's jump on this because this is a huge chance for us to advance scientific computing on JVM and have a clean, nice access from Scala and basically experiment with the data and techniques much easier and much faster. Have all the convenience of Python and R REPL, but backed by a Spark cluster, and maybe some of the nodes running CUDA, right? So we have we can have the most performant uh, platform in the world running the most advanced algorithms. So, you know, let's get to it, guys. And uh, we'll uh, see you at the next SF Spark and SF Scala meetups. Thanks.